Hello there, we are live from our studios in Kukum Limle here on Digital Address GA0992539. This is your home of fearless, credible and independent journalism. Our lead story is this hour. Complaints of heightened insecurity as at least armed, at least one armed robbery case persisted each month of this year. We have a breakdown from January to now as we take you to the family home of the slain police officer where the IGP is headed this afternoon. ECOWAS meeting in Accra targets security situation in the West African sub-region. We'll tell you how the leaders are, how the leaders intend to tackle the increased risk of terrorist attacks and political instability in the sub-region. And President Akufado says government is exploring vaccine development here, even as the country races against time to attain herd immunity in the midst of vaccine shortages. We have details shortly. The pause is brought to you by Global Communities Dignilu Affordable Safe Sanitation. Join us on DSTV 421 Gold TV 144. You can also send us your WhatsApp messages. Let's be let's do the show together. My name is Gifty Ando Apia. This is the pause. Please be my guest.
Those are visuals from the home of the officer who was killed yesterday. Well, this afternoon, the IGP, James Opombueno, is promising to invoke the full might of the Ghana Police Service to bring the perpetrators of Monday afternoon's robbery attack to book. Um, Mr. James Opombueno is currently at the home of the officer uh, who was killed in that robbery attack, and my colleague Manuel Pranting is joining us from there. Hello, Manuel. We can clearly, we can clearly feel the mood at the home. We can clearly feel the home, at the, the, the mood at the home right now. Tell us what is happening uh, in your background right now. Absolutely devastating scenes that uh, we've been seeing in the past couple of hours that we've been here at the family house of Imano Lose, uh, the slain police officer um, from Monday afternoon's um, armed robbery attack. Indeed, the entire hierarchy of the police service has been here assuring the family of its utmost commitment to bringing the perpetrators of that heinous crime um, to book. Um, it's, it's been a bit more than just receiving the uh, you know the, the the assurances of the Ghana Police Service. In fact, we've had family members, you know, who have been wailing this entire period, uh, you know, um, 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 sharing some of their really fondest memories of the gentleman um, whose death they are mourning this afternoon. Well, uh, just a bit of you know context to why this is particularly you know a really painful um, situation for the family. Well, uh, Imanolo say is just about 10 days from becoming. 26 years old his birthday is on 25th of june and he did not live to see his 26th um, birthday and we're learning that he passed out of the ghana police um, training academy less than a year ago it's just about a month and a half to um, his uh, one year anniversary since he passed out of of, of the ghana police uh, training academy so it gives you an essence of the expectation really that the family had of him um, as a budding young man who had just begun his career um, as a security uh, uh, you know officer with we are told the uh, swat um, you know headquarters uh, here in Accra and, and so I just try and get a bit closer to some of the family folks who have uh, you know thrown here um, you know trying to commensurate um, with the bereaved mother and then also um, essentially get a mood of what they are feeling and and I say, and I'll just try and speak to a bit more of the folks here. Well, we're learning that his sister, um, Ruth Abuajua, who we're, uh, we're told has just stepped in, um, will be speaking to us very briefly. But this lady has been um, speaking uh, quite devastating. Me who say we Susana, what we are then out here, Simi? Me ba chow kobi e yemiya. Me ne ne share wo. Even some I see that in Kora Kobi, he has done a lot for us. That means to me, Enka. I am a Kora Danfo, although my husband is a military man. But Osha, dear, call so now. Me only say, Me only say, I was say, skip it in your air tight because we are all in this together. For example, now I can say, me Kwe Jumaba. Saturday, me only say, I was so, sister, me Kwaba. Menyadambiwahintimekwabamobatimenka.Namandeyatisasemuya.Senaobefano.Enamibisase.Senayeyeyejuma.Because.Enaobatinekupolisinewahase.Wachambekuna.Sojanibiyewahase.Wachambetin
no bulletproof, no helmet, no shield. Be be any one of them. And I see a sumano. And the sumano is sumano. The sumano is saying. Yanti asie, yajuwa. Yanti asie. And to me, Pacho, me be so. So, yes, so man, no, so man, yes, so man, no, yes, so man, the same. And to me, Pacho, when you be being found, why, now you're a dear to do, you're a dear, you're a dear, ah, ah, and a IGP Abaha, now IGP, um, or my wish, you must say, Mobe, Bomodiana, a woody fui, or Modio Mo. Uh, 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 answer no answer. Just, just to you know, recap a bit of what she says. Now she's um, questioning really the modus operandi um, um, of the police service. He's asking that um, was Emmanuel on an assignment, and if he indeed was on an assignment, um, what is the protocol uh, for policemen if they're going on assignment? Are they um, supposed to be wearing some protective gear? If they are indeed supposed to, why um, wasn't he wearing? And these are um, questions that James Opon Bueno, the Inspector General of Police, has been assuring um, that the entire police uh, architecture is fervently looking for answers to. Um, but, Sena Namekano, IGP or Bayano, Wakase, Sene Ombeye Bia, Ombe to me, Achi, Udi for you, Omobeye, now Oteno, Ama Wishimo. Oh, me Wishimo, only a Sem no Kano. Now Debia, Samuel Yomoka, a Samuel Yomoka. A bit of how much more, a bit so how, but wait, dear, I ain't yado do, and this one baby be a, I'm only in the minimum ya, because I didn't know, eh, yado do, and the master man make a no no. Well, she's asking for um, a speedy investigation and indeed, um, you know, a fasting, as it were, a resolution of the matter, and we're just learning in just the past couple of minutes that um, Emmanuel just moved out of this particular house to a rented apartment somewhere as Kanda less than 72 hours before he was uh, you know shot to death uh, we learned that uh, he moved from the house on Saturday evening around 5 30 p.m. with an assurance of uh, returning to take his family members to go see where his new home was to be uh, that that assurance will not be claimed as as we have come to learn uh, after he was shot let me speak to this uh, lady with the baby sir I say Saturday now or can say who twenty mattress be an a day? Or can no can they? Or can no? Or can no? Dear, na me me ni ha. Inti me chiba. Ano na wohonum. Inti me Andrew na me ya friend me say Andrew by five o'clock no mono. Ano me nuya ne friend me say ya friend say me mbra na ya shoot to me nuya. No na me say ya shoot to no say say. Ano so mo di sika ko baby na ya friend say ya shoot to no kole buho say. Ano me say. Na se e dey ntini ya shutu no. Ado ko no bambo ben na ya fence empeni for the man on tie ya ya shutu no. E fi say o ko baby ya. I say obi odi sika ko baby de. E go say bambo bi de. So we him net bi de ya fence say e yi no de ya ti otimi she bi. So we na we bi bi an she no. Na ya si on ko. Into Somalia, yes, Somalia, no, no. In fact, so many also. And and she's just reiterating the point that uh, the lady made earlier about questioning the, um, the 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 safety gear and so on that he was supposed to have been uh, wearing. Uh, but but I'm just trying to get answers to how he left. It's in a hand me na high na na ote the only ni na na Saturday ano tuye. Just Saturday ano tuye. Yang kasane a Madina eni etna ye. And Sana, me papa, is if you are Baham, you see. Into a hey, yeah, just aha, and no one's an obenya, a juman mukwine. Aha, a jumano, a ha, no one's an obenya mukwine. And tis a wako hide nine, tis a Saturday, ya obey, if you know, so or quaba, and tis Sandy or Baba, the Sunday near my day. Eddie, I copy your hide nine or can now honour. And I just yet is a Monday, and a pa, yet the issue to know. So well, and to me, say, I just at the S, you know, just a yantias yet, and to penny four, I buy you, who be my yang. A banya who be my yen. Yen we are bema bacupu. Yen chin chin and numinina no no. Into a higher pa. Into our robbers for any dear. In penny phone in yen she shame when you name her ya. Na or my son come on my yen. Yes, Romo pa. Or my high yen. And to give the um, just rehashing of the call. 
uh, by the family for you know a speedy investigation and resolution of this particular matter um, we heard them say that they want justice for uh, their brother their son their friend um, for years uh, you know one of the folks that they actually were looking forward to bringing some sort of spotlight to the family and as you have just learned he moved out of the house less than 72 hours to his death and that's something that is striking the family um, in you know more ways than one we have learned this afternoon also that the ghana police service um, has um, appointed a liaison officer between the family and then the uh, service itself to as it were arrange for um, you know his burial and other um, other arrangements that are so needed um, to uh, you know keep the family really at peace uh, even as investigations um, progress and so there's a liaison officer that has been appointed by the IGP also we know that the case has been given solely to the CID boss Mamiti Wado Dankwa um, essentially you're giving you an indication of the level to which this um, issue has been elevated and then also as we heard the uh, um, IGP mentioned earlier that they are invoking the entire might of um, the Ghana police service to bring the perpetrators to book so in your short currently behind me is the liaison officer currently speaking to the father and a few other members of um, the family um, on the arrangements on exactly how the service is going to proceed um, in conjunction really with the family uh, as the investigations uh, carry on. So Gifty, the, the picture and if you like the mood in the uh, family house of Iman or Osei, uh, who's affectionately called Kobi at home is quite solemn and one that uh, smacks of you know lamentation and uh, real devastation and, 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 and they are asking uh, for a speedy resolution of this particular case. They want a uh, police to bring the perpetrators to Bill Gifty. Um, if you can hear me uh, right here from Millennium City, um, Akaswa, um, in the central region. Thank you. Back to you. Manuel, thank you very much. Uh, Manuel, the uh, Cranting reporting from the home of the slain police officer. As you heard, he had just moved out, got himself a place near Kanda, and that was about 48 hours or 72 hours ago uh, before or after his death. So it appears that perhaps none of his family members even know where he lives. You've heard what they're calling for. They, they call, they, they, first of all, they have concern about heightened insecurity. They also talk about the protection that this officer may have had on the day uh, that he was put on this assignment. They want immediate resolution to the matter, as Manuel said. I want to take you now to... They, back to the crime scene. We were there yesterday. We spoke to some of the eyewitnesses. We spoke to the family of the woman who was killed. My, uh, my colleague, uh, Maxwell Agbaba, is standing by there for us once again. Let's take a look at what is happening there a day after that incident. Maxwell. Mm. Yeah, Gifty, um, the usual beehive of activity that you'll find here in this community very close to the timber market is not existent here um, today. Um, a cloud of grief still hangs on this um, community, not just a cloud of grief, but also a cloud of fear hangs on this community as many of the residents here are unable to go about their normal um, duties. Now, if you come to the community, um, some of the exit points that vehicles use to get in here, um, entry and exit points have been blocked, and it was blocked by the um, community members. So it's very difficult for vehicles that usually use um, this place as a thoroughfare to get to the timber market and other places to use it um, today. The residents tell me that it is because they are still in fear of what happened um, yesterday. If you come here, um, there's this red, um, red cloth that is hanging here, um, very close to this electric pole here. And this is the convenience store where the 40-year-old mother of three used to do her business. So on a normal day when you come, you find her ice chest, you find um, her other words display, displayed here. And for cars and people who use this place as a thoroughfare, 
This is where they usually would get um, sachet water. This is where they usually get drinks um, when they're working uh, because this is also a business enclave. Um, there's a pub here, um, there, there are mechanics here, all, kind, all, all sort of you know, people doing business here. And all of them actually buy from this woman. But today her shop is closed because um, she died uh, yesterday as a result of the shootout. And you can see her tables and everything here. I'm told that the family um, has relocated um, from this community. Um, the mother of three used to live here together with her children. Her husband, I'm told, lived in another community. Yesterday when the incident happened, when we came here, we spoke to the husband, distraught husband, and we are told that he came for them yesterday, to, he came for the children yesterday, and they've relocated from this community. Now, if you come here, this, uh, this base here, this, uh, this makeshift structure, he actually served as a place where many of the community members come to de-stress. So if they want to talk about football, this is where they come. When they want to talk about boxing, um, because the boxing arena is also very close here. This community is also very close to Buku. So when they want to talk about boxing, this is where they come to discuss all of that. On the day when the incident happened, yesterday sometime around 11 a.m. when the incident ha happened, I'm told that there were just about two people here in this structure. But on a normal day, you find about 15 people all gathered here. But for some strange reason, there were only two people in here yesterday. A man who was um, in this room actually saw exactly what happened. And this is the spot where the police officer was actually um, shot. So we are told that the car was parked here, he was inside the car, and then the armed man moved in closely on him and then fired him in the head. Now, there was a man who was in this room who was sleeping. He tells us that when he had a gunshot, he raised his head and saw a very tall man, tall, fair man, who was doing the shooting. By natural instincts, he nearly screamed, but another friend who was with him in there told him to just keep quiet so they all lie down. And that was what happened, and that was how they got saved. That man is with me here today. We are not going to show his face. I don't want you to show your face. Come closely. So carefully, don't show your face. And then you narrate to us exactly um, what happened yesterday. Do not turn. Tell me, you were in this room. Yes. The shooting happened just here, right in front of you. Yes. yes. What did you see? I just lying down. The moment when I hear it, a gun shot him. Pow, pow, pow. Where well, I wake up my head. The moment when I saw his gentleman wear a cap. He was wearing a cap. A cap mm. and a long sleeves and jacket. He was in a long sleeves and a jacket. Yes. Earlier you were telling me that it looked like a bulletproof vest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see something like that. But the moment when the thing happened, you can't open your eye and watch everything very, very, very mm. listen. So you have to hide yourself. So the moment when I see shot in two, two bullets, open the, uh, the, uh, the police side, mm. shot again, and took the gun and passed the bullet van back. Since that time, I was lying down, so I didn't come up again to see what's going on. Yeah. But by natural instincts, you nearly screamed. Now, what happened? Your other friend who was with you, what happened to him? He's, what what's he tell me? That? Oh, okay, quiet, quiet, quiet. Don't, don't talk, don't talk, don't talk. So I have to come down again. I didn't talk again. So that after that, I didn't see anything going, going on again. What I see, they are run away before I take my phone and call the police. One hour one before they arrive here. The police arrived here, you said one hour? No, 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 it can't be one hour. It can't be one hour. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But tell me, at that time that you were in here, hearing the shooting, so you were in this structure, and you were hearing the shooting happening right here. What was going through your mind at that point? Before, I was thinking, it's um, one hour. My, my mind is telling me that they are joking. So the moment when I raise my hand, I see the boulevard is standing there, where the gun shot in, where I said, no, this is a serious problem. So I have to lie down. Mm. Yeah. What was going through your mind? I'm sure you were terrified. You, you, you still look traumatized, even when you've lost your voice as a result of this. Tell me, what was running through your mind at that point? Oh, um, I don't know what to say. But what I think is, um, God has saved me from the death. Because the way the guy is shooting and the place where the guy stands, the place where I was lying down, he can even 
came at any time. So I just thank God he didn't turn the gun to where I, where, where I am. So now that I make something like that. Okay. Because of how close you were, you had the communication between them. What language were they speaking? I, did, I, didn't, I didn't hear any language. Yeah, okay. talking. I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear anything. Okay. You didn't hear anything. Yeah. But some of the people we spoke to yesterday were telling us that they were using the earth word the F word, something I cannot say on TV. Did you hear them saying anything like that? Since that time, I didn't, I didn't hear anything. What I, I didn't hear anything. What I, what I do with myself, I just put it myself and lie down. So I didn't hear anything that time again. I didn't hear anything that time again. How do you feel living in this community today? Now we are afraid. We are now, we're, because we are living in this community, we are all afraid. Because since yesterday, I didn't sleep. Mm. But uh, yeah, I'm very, very shocked. So I didn't sleep. It's not me alone. Our friends also are afraid of what happened yesterday. Before you go, the description for this man again, you say he's tall? Yeah, he's tall. He's tall and wearing a cap. So the moment, the moment when I saw his shooting, I didn't watch his face two times. When, when I wake up, I, was, I just saw his head and his face you know, loud and again. So I didn't force myself to watch him. Mm. Is he dark or fair? Yeah, I didn't watch it before I was in sleep. So when I wake up, I see his screen. So I didn't watch it very, very, very well. Yeah, I was in sleep. Was in sleep. Okay. Thanks for giving us this information. But don't show your face, please. Don't show your face. Okay. Yeah, so you can now walk out. Um, yeah, let me speak to um, another man who was not... Don't show your face, please. <laughs> uh, don't show your face. Kindly come here. Kindly come here, please. Another man who also lives in this community and has been talking about, I wanted to turn this way, um, who has an idea also of what happened. You were not in this building, but you usually come here. Yeah. What happened yesterday? Oh, yeah. I, was, I heard the news in Joy News, in my Adum uh, uh, TV, and I quickly rushed to this place. So when I reached here, I saw that there's a lot of people over here screaming, oh, oh, this, this. and I said, oh, what's happening? They said, oh, my auntie who is selling provision and those stuffs over here mm. is dead. There's an Arnold Roberts has come and attack us, uh, uh, attack a Vubulion van over here. Mm. And I said, ah, when did this happen? Because we have not heard of these things before in this community, mm. you see. That's what, that's what make me, mm. that's what make me come here. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how are you feeling, you the residents, how are you feeling here? I understand that yesterday you attempted to block the exit, exit points because you thought they would use the side out of the community, but that did not happen. They used um, another exit point to get out. But you were telling me that the bullion van, this is the place that it usually, uh, uh, this is the stretch that it uses usually to get to the timber market where it takes monies and all of that. Yeah, it's true. The bullion van have been passing here all the time. Even I've even told him that I've even they, even when they pass here, they throw all their uh, their glass and giving them one now. They shouldn't use the bullion van to pass here because this place is not good place for them to use a bullion van to pass on this lane because this place is roughly, you see. So the moment I heard that the, this car has been attacked, uh, this is what I said. You see, it has come on. You see. So you actually won the bullion van driver not to be using this yeah, yeah yeah that's what i told you but any idea why he continued okay the, the idea that i have is i've been seeing that you see the junction there getting to palladium yeah. to uh, uh the other junction over there. there's a huge traffic over there so they wanted to dodge they will pass here to uh, the market inside yeah uh -huh. that's why i saw that he has been passing here mm. yeah so as residents how are you feeling in this community i can see of activities going on here today that is that is not normal for you people living here now now the, we are we are not feeling well over because we are dramatized because we have not seen such incident over here before mm. you see because this thing the, uh, even this area if you are a thief and you come here you take it easy to go out mm. you take it easy to go out because the way the guys over here we are all united over here mm. uh -huh. So anytime we see that if such incident is coming, we normally look up and say, oh, child, this is what is going on. Somebody's coming, you see. Uh -huh. yeah. So the moment when they were coming, we didn't hear that they are coming with guns and those. We didn't see anything. Yeah. Uh -huh. What we got to realize that, oh, they said, this is what is happening over here. That's what some of my colleagues told me. Okay. Thanks for talking to us. Thank you, too. Okay. So, um, uh, so can you walk out of frame? Okay, yeah. So at this point, we want to take you, um, give to you, want to, why don't you have you know um, a view of the community and how 
busy it looks um, on a regular day. Even today, um, business here has toned down because of the incident that happened um, here yesterday. And once again, this is the spot. So this is where we had the blood of the police officer. It, is, it has been covered with um, suits from a black tie, um, obviously to cover um, the blood. So this is where it happened. And then this is where um, the eyewitness who we spoke to just some minutes ago was sleeping when the incident um, happened. So he saw the shooting, saw the person who did the shooting, by natural instinct wanted to scream, but managed not to scream. Um, let's, let's walk you through the community. Let's have a good view of what this community looks like. Now, the timber market, the timber market, the busy timber market is just some meters away from this place. It's just 100 meters away from this place. So in here, you find um, mechanics who do business here. So you see all these um, vehicles here. So you find the owners of, the, of, of these vehicles come in here to visit the mechanics to check up on their cars. So there are a lot of activities here. This is a pub. This is a drinking spot, uh, which is here. Earlier, I came here to get water. Um, the woman who sells the water, in fact, when she saw me approaching, her face changed and she told me that that is what it feels like now doing business in this community and when i spoke to her she was like she, i mean she was watching me carefully because she didn't know she knows that i'm not from this community and she didn't know she does not know the kind of threat that you know i am i will pose to her so she has to be very careful it tells you the fear um, that the people here um, are experiencing now now this is a place where they sell kinky women busy doing business. That was what was happening um, here in this community when the robbers invaded um, this busy place and then attacked the bullion van. I want to show you what happened yesterday. So the residents tried blocking the road using this uh, metal here. The operation we are told lasted three minutes and they tried blocking the road using this metal. But unfortunately, the robbers used another exit. They used the other side. So they were, they were able to um, get away um, from, the, from the community. Now, these things were put here today because the community members tell me that they don't want anyone to use their space as a thoroughfare for now. They say they are grieving. And it is important for them to be able to grieve in peace. And they don't want any disturbances of any sort. So they've blocked. This, um, this exit and entry and um, points gifty. So this is what is happening here. People still living in fear, a once vibrant community. Now, it's not a case, gifty. Maxwell, thank you very much uh, for that very detailed report there. Maxwell Agbagba, who has revisited the crime scene from yesterday, uh, hearing from witnesses and conveying how much fear has fallen on this particular community today. Meanwhile, Joy News has secured exclusive details of how the driver of the bullion van who was attacked by the robbers yesterday was saved at the hospital. Eric Ochre is, uh, uh, is one of, uh, he is the driver by the way, and he got gunshot. Let's hear from the doctor. Yesterday we were all with the sad incident that happened uh, around a uh, I think boxing, uh, Bukum boxing area close to Kolebu. Victim was to us at who happens to be the driver of the Bullon van. Um, he had sustained gunshot injuries to the chest and to the limbs. He was in a very bad situation. He was in shock and our assessment showed that the bullet had penetrated the chest wall and damaged vessels and was bleeding heavily into the chest. He also had bullets in the thoracic spine and also the gunshot injury damaged the right hand. There were pellets in the whole of the right upper limb, in the arm and in the forearm. As soon as he was brought 
Though he was fully conscious, he was drowsy and was in shock with very low blood pressures. In fact, his blood pressure was about 80 systolic and 50 diastolic. So it means he was in a severe shock and we started resuscitation. Uh, we, we tried to stabilize him. Now, in the process of the resuscitation, we noticed that even though we were giving him much fluids and blood transfusion, his blood pressure kept dropping. And so we did further evaluation and realized he was bleeding actively in the chest and had accumulated a lot of blood in the chest, which will be, have been detrimental to his survivor. So as an emergency procedure, we put a chest tube into the chest to drain the blood. But we realized that whilst we were draining the blood, the, he was still bleeding profusely in the chest. So yesterday in the night, around 9 p.m., he was rushed to theater by the cardiothoracic surgeons where he had thoracotomy done. In other words, surgery that opens into the chest to stop all the bleeding points and to be stabilized. As we speak, he had surgery yesterday and he is fairly stable but is still on the recovery wards of the cardiothoracic. If you brought in fresh as an accident victim, there are steps to get you alive. Uh, you are not rushed to theater. You are taken through processes that will identify life-threatening situations such as shock and bleeding and your airway. And we deal with these things and get you fairly stable before we wheel you to theater. So the six hours, we were resuscitating and stabilizing him, which is the key to survivor for any accident victim. For all accident victims, the first processes, which we call the primary survey, is the most important thing to, to be done, which identifies life-threatening situations and deal with them. And that is precisely what we did. So with the six hours, everybody, all the staff in the emergency were actively resuscitating him with fluids, with blood, and uh, doing emergency procedures on the ward, like passing chest tubes. And all these things got him better. That allows you to now take him to theater to intervene definitely. You know, the preventive aspect is very important. I think the policemen who are detailed to do this sort of work uh, should be armed with bulletproof vests and things like that. And uh, as the IGP rightly requested, they should be using vehicles like armored vehicles, not pickups. Uh -huh. At least you put in all the measures to prevent and to prevent. But once the incident happens and people are injured, they should be rushed to the every nearby hospital. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is very important. Once the injury happens, fortunately, mm -hmm. they were within the reach of Kolebu. So he should be rushed to Kolebu immediately. If Kolebu is far, the Osha Fort Clinic is there, he could have been taken there. They will have started some resuscitative measures and then pushed to Kolebu. For us, once they are brought, we do everything, you know, to get them out of danger. You know, for you to be in severe shock, it means if nothing is done, you will die. <laughs> That's how bad it is. Because there were pellets in the chest and he was actively bleeding in the chest. He had life-threatening conditions. One, he had hemothorax, and two, he was in shock. So these two things alone can kill him if intervention is not done quickly. 
the hemothorax, that is a blood collection in the chest, and the fact that hemodynamically he was shocked. If no intervention is done, he, you won't make it. Yes, you will die. And this intervention ought to be done pretty fast. You've got to act fast. You have short time on your hand when you have these emergencies on your hand. The first hours is the golden hour to save the person. Therefore, these things need to be addressed immediately. The shock and then the hemothorax. And that is what we did precisely. And we succeeded uh, getting him out of life-threatening situation. And that's the doctor who helped save the life of this driver from that robbery incident there. I want to take you down memory lane. If you look at the statistics available, at le there has been at least one armed robbery in each of the six months of this year already. January recorded the most cases, about six of them, and these are reported cases. So there is a possibility that there are cases that have not been reported to the police. There are cases that have not been heard about, but actually have occurred. We want to take you down memory lake. Take a, take a look at some of the robbery cases that we've recorded in this country so far. Over the past week alone, there have been at least four separate incidents of violent attacks in Accra. These incidents, which were mainly armed robbery attacks, started from the Gimpa bypass. The suspects involved hid in nearby bushes and smashed the side glass of oncoming vehicles in an attempt to rob occupants. You guys should avoid the Gimpa stretch late night. They tried to rob me, but I was smart. I had to continue driving. I sped off, and that's what they drew. Can you imagine? On Wednesday, June 9, there were two armed robbery incidents involving gun-wielding men on motorbikes. In the first of the two incidents, the robbers accosted a victim at Pig Farm, fired five warning shots, then shot him in the stomach, leaving blood splattered on the section of the road. Then I just hear a two down warning shoot. Po, po, two. So after they stopped the other biker and they collected his bag and they shoot him two bullets. In a second incident, Three gun-wielding men on motorbikes entered the Forex Bureau adjacent the fire service headquarters, which is also a few meters away from the police headquarters. They shot two workers and robbed them of their monies. On Saturday evening at about 9.30 p.m., a male driver informed the Achimota School District Police during a patrol he had been attacked by two armed men. The driver, who had been shot then led police to the crime scene, and upon arrival, the two robbers fled the scene as they escaped to a nearby forest. Another robbery incident was also recorded around the cell fuel station at Baalishi near East Ligon at about 7.40 p.m. on Sunday. The two robbers sat on a motorbike, sped off using the Lagos Avenue stretch immediately after the incident. The police has made at least five arrests in connection with the crimes over the week. It is, however, advising robbery victims to formally file complaints on their experiences to the nearest police station. So let me break down for you the statistics there, what the numbers are saying at the point. And these are reported cases. In fact, some of the reported cases might even just slip out of uh, uh, your, your hands. But i just take you through what we have here. Like I said, January alone recorded about six of them. The subsequent you know, months, about one and two. But let's take it case after case. In January, um, Robert shot a 25-year-old driver in the leg at the entrance of Wulugu Senior High School. That happened on the 2nd of January. An Okada rider again robbed another rider of his motorbike motorcycle at gunpoint here in Tesano, uh, in Accra. This happened on the 5th of January. And then gunmen attacked a water company at Anlo Afiadenigba Junction in the Volta region. They made away with an undisclosed amount of money as well as other uh, valuables and this occurred on the 14th of January. Same January, armed robbers shot dead a young police officer who was escorting a bullion van and bolted with the monies in the van. This happened on the 18th of January so that's your first bullion van attack in, in this year. A police officer again was shot dead in a daylight attack at the Nyankumaso, uh, Nyankumaso near Obwasi. This happened on 20th of January. So you see a trend of billion vans being attacked and daylight robberies as well. Uh, I bring you still in January. Armed robbers besieged a church in Oibi 
where they shot the head pastor and then they stabbed a worshipper. This was on the 27th of January. Again, armed men killed a police officer and injured another on the Pramkesi Techiman Road. This also happened at the beginning of this year. That is January. So I want to move quickly to June. An armed robbers raided a forest burial close to the police headquarters here in Usu. We know that story. Very, very close to the police headquarters. The armed robbers again killed a policeman in a billion van at Kolebu around the Bukum Boxing Arena and left the driver seriously injured. That happened just yesterday. Well, these reports of killings and murders are not restricted to the national capital. In the Ashanti regional capital, Kumasi, the situation has been similar. My colleague Erastus Asari Donko has been cataloging the incidents. He's joining me right now. Hello, Erastus. Erastus? Yeah, Gifty. Erastus, take us through the cases that you have reported on. So I must say that inside Kumasi itself, there have been many of such robberies and uh, phone snatching incidents and all that. But across the Shanti region, the ones that we have worked on and we can vividly recall offhand, as the, if you remember late last year, somewhere in September, then the bullion van um, robbery started somewhere at Manso, Edubia, Manso, Kenyago Road. Uh, we understand that they were uh, three in number, all armed with AK-47 and pump action guns. And if you look at the vehicle itself and the way it was sprayed with bullets, you remember that one cashier died on the spot. He got hit. He was sitting right behind the uh, driver. He was hit uh, by the AK-47. It went through the body of the hard body vehicle and then went to uh, him many times. Then the policeman who was sitting on the front also sustained a severe gunshot wound, uh, plus another person. The driver also uh, sustained some injury. Now, fast forward, a dance, a squad dancing. Another robbery on a bullion van happened there uh, as well. One person was killed. Then, if you recall, many... Uh, of the drivers plying the Bulgar Kumasi route. They, at a point in time, they demonstrated they went on a strike because there were highway robberies occurring, and so they went on strike and decided not to move there again until the police uh, does something about uh, those robberies. Let me come to just uh, this month. Bokrum Estate, a company called CSSL. They, are, uh, uh, they provide... Uh, uh, financing services. That one to armed robbers stormed that place, broad daylight, gunned down one person, and took away about 140,000 uh, Ghana cities. There have been some murders, unsolved murders as well. The ones that come directly to my head right now, uh, if you look at the murder of women, one at the Sifikum, some teenager, 16 year old, who was murdered. Um, some of her body parts were fingers and other things were taken off. Um, if you go to Achuma uh, Kwangoma, one woman, uh, Sabina, I, remember, I, I recall vividly, she sells uh, watermelons. She woke up in the morning, went to uh, purchase watermelons as usual, and she did not come home. The next day they found the body by the roadside. The breast was missing. Uh, other fingers and other parts were missing. Children have not been let, left out. In the month of May alone, four children went missing um, at Asnomaso, Ofenso, and Obwase. With Obwase one, within just uh, some few hours, they searched, and then they found that he had been struggle, uh, strangled. That was a four-year-old boy by a tenant, and the body placed under uh, his bed. When he came to uh, Asnomaso, that four-year-old boy was murdered. He went missing a day. He was, his body was found the next day in an uncompleted toilet with nail holes in his head. And ostensibly, you could see that there was a wooden plank with nails on it. So uh, our conviction is that they used that to hit the head many times and the belly, uh, killing him. The killers of this boy have not been found till now. Uh, the four-year-old girl who was found at Offenso, she also went missing a week later. Uh, her body was found, her throat was slit, 
And until now, one person has been arrested. He says he doesn't know anything about it. As we speak, there is a fourth child who has gone missing for two weeks now. Uh, four-year-old Abdullah is still missing. They, they've not been able to find him. And the parents are still searching. The police are still searching uh, for him. And so I must say that it's been uh, quite a year full of uh, crimes, many of them unsolved. Uh, many of them have gone very cold. Uh, that uh, makes uh, the people sit on tenterhooks in some parts of Ashanti region. Other stories, other related crime stories, and also getting us some responses from the police in the, in the region. But wrap up with me on what people say. How do people feel about this, given what is happening here in Accra as well? Well, and so uh, I must say it just heightens the fear. When you come to Ashanti region now, there are certain areas where you cannot move after six. If you have to move around these areas, then you have to move in groups. There are many areas like that in Kumase itself. When you go beyond Kumase, areas where these incidents have occurred, uh, people are very, very uh, scared. Uh, children are protected all the time. And that is how come a woman uh, just screamed uh, for help and people pounced on a young man uh, thinking that he was trying to hurt some children who were, found, who, were, who, who were found in the bush. And so you could feel that heightened sense of fear. Mm. Now on the Manso, uh, Kenya, Manso, Dubia roads, uh, those areas where they do illegal mining, it's difficult for these days for bullion vans to travel like they do uh, previously on that stretch. It's a bad road and uh, there, were high, there are highway robberies all around that particular place. So I must say that people want the police to do more than they are doing now. They want answers. They want uh, solutions. They want closure to many of these cases uh, to bring back that uh, self-confidence that they do have within the security system. Erastus, thank you very much. Erastus Osari Donko, there is a member of the security uh, desk here at Joy News. And like I said, we are in touch with the police as well to provide the answers that Erastus uh, is talking about. Uh, my colleague Ohim Interior has been speaking to them. Let me get, bring on the phone Dr. Ishmael Norman. He's president of the Institute for Security, Disaster and Emergency Studies. Uh, Dr. Norman, thank you for your time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let me take your thought on what, on the trend that you, you, we, we are seeing at the moment. We're seeing a lot of bullion van attacks. We're seeing broad daylight attacks. What, is, there, is there a way to explain this trend? There are many ways to explain it, but one of them is simply that gives the, the criminals see opportunity. They see that uh, the bullion vans were not hardened, meaning they were not armored vehicles, meaning the police were not really poor, the vans were not really well trained. They had, uh, you know, weak uh, weapons that you cannot simply maneuver or draw in the front of, of, of a bullion Ban or even when you are in a bucket. So um, that is basically an opportunity analysis, opportunity cost, and they see that they can get away with it because the post crime event uh, investigation is also poor. So they look at they look at how porous it is, how easily they can get away with it. Take a lot of money and run away on a motor bicycle, and that's it. So I think uh, it is the way our system is designed right now making it easier, easier for the criminals to basically do whatever they want. Is that the only explanation? There have been people saying um, it's perhaps, be, I mean, we know the fundamental problem of lack of jobs, but people are even actually saying that, well, people don't have jobs because we have stopped the, uh, uh, the fight against, against Galam Say. That, that doesn't really sound tenable, do you th don't you think? Well, the, the unintended consequences of the, of the, there are two things. The unintended consequences of the uh, Lambda activities uh, and the Lambda State is all part of it. And I actually have said this before, that the, uh, the vigilante groups that have been disbanded, they will morph into criminal entities. And if you look at the progression of things, 
then you can go back to that period and then move forward. Mm -hmm. That coincided with the ban on Galamse. So you have released a lot of people with a lot of energy who don't have jobs, who don't have a way of earning a living, and they are desperate people. So what do you expect them to do? Some of them feel that the best way for them to make a living and enjoy life a little bit is to go in that, the, the direction of crime. And this becomes so easy because for them, um, because our police force is a little bit behind the times. They are not doing pre-crime analysis and, and scenarios and simulation exercises. You know, so the criminals are ahead of the game right now. Hmm. How then do we tackle it? Would you say that it's a state of hopelessness? No, 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 no. The, the, the security of the country is still sound. Okay. We have moments of upheavals, no matter what. Any country has, goes through these moments uh, where there's uptick of crime. Uh, but I think our police force need to regroup, and uh, need to strategize and find a way to re-engage the community because all these people live in the communities and the, the people know them. Um, I think it would be best to bring back community police, uh, visibility police, but because it was designed by the previous government, it looks like there's a great deal mm. of reluctance, reluctance on the part of the current group to actually copy something that appeared to have worked very well. So um, I will advise that you know, they should draw back, uh, push back all the political thinking that is stopping them from, you know, uh, adopting a system that really worked well for everybody mm -hmm. and, and adopt the visibility police and the community policing, revamp that and make it stronger. You know, uh, how, I, how do you I think? think mm -hmm. Go ahead, yeah, I was just going to ask how you think, uh, to what extent you think that the visibility police at the time actually led to reduction in crime? We, we didn't hear so many of these kind of dastardly events happening in uh, two billion, billion vans or police officers. Whenever agents of security, police officers, begin to be shut down by criminals, you know that there is a great deal, uh, a, a large cohort of people that are very disgruntled against central government because these people are agents. So if you're upset with the government, don't take it on police officers. Uh, they are also struggling just like you are. Don't take it on innocent people. Tackle it with those that can solve the problem, not the agents who are just trying to also, you know, make a living and uh, take care of their families. So I am pleading with the, with the criminals, if, if money you want, take the money and run. Leave the police officers alone. You know, the money is almost insured anyway. So if... If it's lost today, it will be recouped someday, and the customers will pay it back somehow. So don't kill the people, even if you rob people, don't kill them. They haven't done you any wrong. All you want is a property, take it, and run. You know, so I think our police security forces have to do a lot more. Okay. And somehow, they have to go after the perpetrators, but they also have to uh, also treat them as human beings, they, when they arrest them, no beat them, no cane them, no steal their things from them, you know. Um, so there are a lot that we need to do uh, hmm. to get things a little bit back to where right, it Let was me just before. take your thoughts quickly on this final question. There are people who are saying that the IGP should be sacked, but there are also people who are saying that that won't solve the problem. Sacking an IGP doesn't change anything. It's all about the structures that you have in place to police the country. What do you make of this? What's your take? I have seen I have seen the debate. I have read some of the debate about calling for the sucking of the IGP. Let me ask you this them this question through you, Gifty. Do they know the the performance objective of the IGP? Has he made the performance objective according to the people who put them there, who put him there? If he has made a performance objective according to the people who put him there I don't have a right to call for his hacking. What we need to do is to go to the people that put him there and ask them, is the IGP performing to the level that you thought he would perform? If not, 
then what are you doing about it? I don't like to tackle individual personalities and positions of responsibility because something bad happened. When students fail, do we suck all the lecturers in the university? Or if you can answer positively that when university students fail, when they can't find jobs, when they are, they are, they are hopeless, uh, do we punish the lecturers? If we can punish the lecturers, then let's start the IGP. If we cannot, then I think we should find an alternative way to discussing the issue. The issue is about lapses in security, not the personality of the IGP. They, they, well, they will raise the argument about leadership, that most of the things, uh, have been, when it comes to execution of tasks, it's all about leadership. Leadership ought to be able to put in place systems that helps them to deliver on the set targets. If the, the criminal justice system does not only include the police. It includes the police, the lawyers, the judges, the investigators, the community. So if the criminal justice system is the crime watch, it's not working well, we should all fix the problem. We shouldn't push it on the head of one entity. It's beginning to remind me when a champion, uh, Ignacio, Ignacio Scuti, a champion was in power when he rained, they blamed him. When he didn't rain, they blamed him. This is what is happening. Let us stop the blame game and find solutions because we are all part of the solution. Very well. Thank you very much, Doc, for your time this afternoon. Dr. Ishmael Norman is the president of the Institute of Security, uh, Disaster and Emergency Studies. We're still staying on security. The minority in parliament is asking President Akufuado to sit up and deal with what the minority is calling the growing insecurity in the country. The spokesperson on defense and interior, James Agoga, says yesterday's killing of the policeman in Jamestown among four other recent deaths of policemen shows no one in this country is safe. Ms. Agaga says the security situation is worsening because of poor management of the police service, including keeping the keeping of numerous pensioners in the service. Joseph Opokugapo is joining me live with details. He's been monitoring this press conference. Hello, Joseph. Share with us further details that the minority gives. Gifty. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And so the ranking member on Parliament, Defence and Interior Committee, James Agaga, and the minority chief, Muntaka Kamubara, and a number of other MPs on the minority side have been addressing the media this afternoon, expressing concern about the security situation in the country. Uh, they say per the account, there's been about four or five different incidents of police people being killed in the country over the last uh, week or so, which he considers a very troubling job. And the minority leader and I do is joining his life. We, we saw the media briefing today by your colleagues on the minority side about the security situation. Um, are you worried about the latest incidents, including the killing of a policeman yesterday, as the rest of the audience? Certainly, uh, President must take immediate steps to arrest the deteriorating security situation in the country and the growing incidence of crime. It's a function of unemployment. It's a function of lack of opportunity that government must be creating. And all the investment that national security and the Minister for Interior did on CCTV cameras, what's the output of What's this impact? on our quest to collectively fight the crime. The president can be assured that we will support him in protecting lives and ensuring the peace and safety of our citizens. But those investments, we demand returns on them. Do you get and, a sense? You know, when Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Daniel sought to do politics with some of these matters for the death of some policemen, he must keep his way. He, get the sense. he yes. must keep his way. We want to be able to respect what he says as vice president of our republic. You get the sense the investment that's supposed to go into security are not going into what, the right way. What, what, what he promised and pledged, where is it? And two, the politicization of the police uh, service, uh, reducing it into partisan context. It's what we destroy the Ghana police service. Should it be the we president? Allow professionals to take care, regardless of their political background. Should it be the president? That um, the minority leader, Aaron Idris, is also um, MP for Tamale South, uh, demanding 
that um, leadership in the country actually sets up and deal with the security situation as they've been created currently, and he's been insisting that. Uh, the thing that there are issues with some of the investment that government says it's made into the security space over the years, which they are not seeing the returns on, including uh, some of the assurances that come from Vice President ba uh, Mahmoud Baumia that the police will be supported with the adequate tools and equipment. One of the things that, again, at the press briefing earlier today, the ranking member on Parliament, Defence and Interior Committee complained about had to do with the people that the minority says are people who are supposed to be on pension and are not supposed to be within the police service. And the reference was to um, a number of officers, including the Inspector General himself and some other senior officers, and says that that is not something that should be happening. And it's part of how come the police service, in terms of the work that they do, there is some form of demoralization, and a lot of the uh, officers there do not have the edge to get their jobs done, which they say it's a worrying thing. And finally, He's also been expressing concern that in response to these concerns having to do with the shooting yesterday, there's been conflicting directives from both um, the Bank of Ghana and the police in terms of when the various banks should provide the necessary uh, armored vehicle bullion van in order to be able to better protect the cars that they are transporting and the police officers. And he's saying that those two institutions should reconcile their positions on the issue. Kipti. Mm. Um, but Joseph, we'll come back to you uh, to Parliament to get a glimpse of the vetting uh, uh, that happened also in Parliament today. But let me leave you uh, for now. We'll come back to you. Joseph Apoku Gapo there. I want to take you back to the Ashanti region where the police command there says it will not rule out contract killing in a shooting of the wife of driver of the Ghana National Petroleum Company, Benedicta Pokia Sapo, uh, was shot at close range in her Range Rover vehicle at a spot near airport runabout on Sunday dawn. She was later pronounced dead at the Konfanoji Teaching Hospital. Police say four men on board a green Toyota Camry sped off after the shooting, and they've since mounted a search for the four suspects as they await release of CCTV footage from the National Security to Aid Investigations. Public Relations Officer for the Ashanti Region Command, ASP, Godwin Ayano, tells Ohimi Terrier of our security desk Two witnesses, including the husband of the deceased, have been assisting with investigations. And reports of two people uh, losing their lives in Kumase and Ejiso municipality. So thanks for the opportunity to speak to us. Let's go straight to the issue of this shooting incident around the airport runabout. What are the details? Who are involved? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me just use the opportunity to uh, greet your cherished uh, viewers and listeners. I must say, yes, uh, the regional police command has recorded um, a case of alleged murder of a lady who happened to be the wife of uh, Nana Ajaman Prempe. The husband reported to the police last two days that he was returning uh, with the wife from town. He was driving in his car while the wife was also driving in hers. And some young guys, numbering about four in, an, uh, in a uh, private vehicle, that is a saloon uh, car, crossed them. And when he also stopped to question them, one of them shot at the wife. So the police have initiated investigation into that alleged murder case. We invited the complainant who is now the bereaved husband of the late uh, lady is giving us some leads. He was in the company of other persons. The command has also invited those persons to also come and then give statement to corroborate whatever the gentleman is telling the police. So far, no arrest has been made, but then we are in touch with the National Security Secretariat because of the CCTV cameras mounted around the airport and runabout. I'm sure when we're able to get the footage, we'll be able to get some leads that will help us unravel uh, the circumstances that actually led to this alleged murder of uh, the young lady. It's early days yet, but what does your investigation suggest? Is it just, you know, provocation, you know, reaction from the gentleman or probably it's a robbery, it's a murder, you know, story. 
Well, from the uh, narrative, uh, we are not ruling out uh, contract killing because nothing was taken from them. They were not robbed of any of their personal effects. But from uh, what the gentleman is telling the police, we are suspecting contract killing. Notwithstanding, we would have to look at all the pros and cons with regard to this very case that we are investigating. Uh, I'm sure as uh, we go uh, forward, we'll be able to know exactly what happened on that uh, fateful day. So when exactly did this incident happen? You mentioned uh, the, the place or the location of the incident and also mentioned Wanana Ajimai. Who is he? He is a complainant in the case. The Najiman Pemper is the complainant in the case. And he happens to be the husband of the late uh, woman who has lost their life through this uh, unfortunate incident. I think the incident happened two days ago in the night, late night. According to him, they were returning from town somewhere around 12.30 a.m. there about when the uh, incident happened. Since then, he has been in touch with the police and he's actually cooperating with us. And I'm sure with the leads that we are getting and then the CCT footage I'm talking about here, if we're able to get any concrete uh, video uh, footages, I think it is going to help us in our course. Residents in the region are becoming apprehensive. Over the last one month, there's been a series of crime activities being recorded in the region. The Ibantama mobile money robbery incident it happened broad under broad daylight. The estate junction mobile money robbery. It did also happen, you know, during the broad daylight. And then we're also talking about this gun issue where a lady has been shot. Is the police losing it as far as security of the people is concerned? We are not losing it at all. Let me just tell you here and now that when we talk about crime situation in the region, comparing these cases you're talking about and that of last year and then the past years, I would say relatively crime is low. There are statistics. The first and second quarter of this year, we have not had cases on the ascendancy. They are rather very low, but we have recorded one or two violent cases. For which reason you are uh, trying to, excuse me, create impression? Well, perhaps we had also had some conversation with the general public, and this is what they are telling you. But as a spokesperson for this noble institution, I can stand and then tap my chest to say that crime in the region is very low. Let me just tell you that these two cases or three cases that you mentioned, as we speak, arrests have been made. Some persons have been arrested. Um, in both cases, we had video footages via uh, CCTV cameras. We've been able to identify some persons, but because we have not come out to tell the general public that this is what we have done, people think these cases are unresolved. ASP uh, Godwin Ahiano speaks for the Ashanti Region Police. They're speaking to a human interior of our security desk about the situation, security situation in the region. I want to take a very quick break. We'll be right back. When we return, we'll take you to Parliament. We'll take a look at the vetting going on there. All right, so welcome back to the show. Many thanks for staying with us. I want to take you to Parliament where the vetting is ongoing. Marco Krikumante uh, has been vetted now. Let's listen in. Um, the infrastructure problem, the funding problem, and then the final one, which is always disturbing the creative people when they get old, is the pension. And so all these things will be solved if we go by this document we are going to have the right pecs in the right holes. Thank you. 
Anabute. So you believe it will, it will cover all the challenges that have sure. bedeviled the industry for some time. Let me go to the second question. The president recently inaugurated a 15-member committee to oversee the organization of the Beyond the Return. It's co-chaired by your boss, Honorable Awal, and the finance minister. Is the Beyond the Return program going to be an Accra event like we saw in the year of return? Um, we've been talking about do promoting domestic tourism. Most of our tourist sites are underdeveloped. The World Bank gave us 40 million to develop some of the sites. What do you think we must leverage on with this Beyond the Return program that you've spoken about that is a 10-year program to develop all our domestic sites to bring tourism to number one as the number one foreign exchange earner for this country? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. If we get most of our roads fixed, and then we create more tourist sites. I'm saying creating more tourist sites because we see a lot of opportunities that we've not taken advantage of at the moment. The home of ex-President Rollins, the home of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, all of these venues qualify to be tourist sites. Casa Prepon, Company Limited, Club VA, Accra Brewery Limited, all of them qualify to be tourist site, depending on how ready we are to sell our story. And so domestic tourism would boom. In, in my last meeting with Edum Hine in Kumase, he mentioned that nine life in Kumase was almost dead. And, and it is, a, it is a minus for tourism. And so we, we are getting some investors on board, some internally, some international, who are showing interest in doing things in Ghana because they came for a year of return and saw it was a country they could invest in. So we'll engage more and then get some of these uh, experts and that are home, how we can create, make the home a tourist site to attract people to who just want to come and see. Uh, where I come from, um, we can create some museum because the one small town had produced three leaders in this country. And so we have President Ekufuado's father, we have General Ekufu, and then President Ekufuado. So we have a museum that will, will be like a presidential museum, sort of, on the mountain. So we, we, would, we are going to add some more strategies to, to, to boom domestic tourism, just like we want to do for alumni uh, tourism. A weekend, everybody should go back to your old school from Friday to Sunday. It will boom fuel, it will boom data, it will boom hotel, drinks for the whole weekend. And so I pray we, God gives us the strength and then we, we, we will influence whatever we can. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Well, the tourism sector is an activity-based sector. You must generate a lot of events to be able to generate the kind of boom you are talking about. I know a Edumine has a jazz club at the cultural center, which is not being patronized. Um, Kwame Eugene is from my constituency, Fadama, Kankwe Central, and uh, Baba, three uh, music CEO, three media, is also from there. I want to build a music studio in my area. How much does it cost to build one? And would your ministry support me in building one for my area? Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, <laughs> your, your tastes will determine the kind of studio you you would you you want to do and the amount involved. Um, there are some studios that the mixer just the mixer will cost over a million dollars. Uh, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so it is it is it is subjective. So yeah, get the mixer. <laughs> and then the the mini ones, domestic ones. I'm talking about Okai Quay Central, Abeka La Paz, Tesano. I'm not talking about uh, uh, Jay Z and the likes. <laughs> I'm talking about building people in my area, Fadama, okay. Abeka. <laughs> okay. Um, even if you want a studio that will cost you 100,000, you can get it. 100,000 Ghana cities cry if you want a studio. Because it's just a PC, two speakers, they call it a studio. But if you want the one that will give you the sounds that some of our top performers used to produce and, and, and timeless sounds, it takes more. And so I think I will engage you um, later on. And then I take advice from um, um, Honorable Tete. Tete. It will help the people in your neighborhood, so the undergrounds will get the opportunity to also come to the studio and record. And we'll pray that other MPs will emulate, so that we can get these mini studios across the country. Thank you, Anama. Um Yeah, it's okay. It's all right. Yes, Nilante. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairman. Uh, I want to say congratulations to my very good friend, but uh, today is going to be a good day because if you expect that. Some of us are going to be a bit difficult for you because you, you have a very difficult stance against people who appear before you whenever you appear as a judge in any position. So, so you should expect it. And he knows me. Uh, those days when we used to do the embassy double do and things, they were young ones who used to follow us. So you remember Alan Zigzaga, Alan Chikichaka, and the rest of you? Remember them? Carlos Alberto, cross a loss. Honorable uh, Chair, for your information, Alex, before he passed yesterday. He passed yesterday? Yesterday, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, Mark, first let me ask you what are the components of the creative arts industry? Okay. Um, I need to go into my books. There are many. <laughs> okay, so I start. Film. Let me rephrase it. Okay. What are the components in the creative arts sector? Okay. And um, do you think there has been a balanced attention to the various components? Um, uh, okay, we, we, we have, let me mention the components and then yes. Okay, some, okay. So, film fine arts, music, um, events, media, media traditional and the new media, music, um, um, fashion, they, 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 they're about 11, crafts, yeah, crafts, yes, painting, that's fine art, uh, yes, to some extent, to some extent, we've not given the attention equitably. Um, it, is so, it is so because it's a pull and push situation. Some push more extremely, and others by their nature think that it must happen. And so just about two weeks ago, I listened to Kusia Baji's show, and the people from um, the model industry said, were on the show saying that we've not given them enough attention. To some extent, it is true. But when the cake is small, those whose voices kind of come across as loudest often tend to get their attention. So I agree with you. We must give the rest of them equal attention. Mr. Chairman, you know the reason why I've asked this question? Because we are having the same scenario in the area of sports, for example. And I'm happy with the answer you're giving. Because sports, for example, the footballers will make so much noise. Attention is all football. Then the other disciplines are dying. It's the same with the creative arts. Those who can make the noise are those we give attention to. And then the other components suffer. 
would you look at it and see how? Because it doesn't lie within you and I, our purview, to kill the talent God has given somebody by our policies and actions. So would you advise or support your minister in changing the trend so we can give equal attention to the various components within the industry? Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, thank God, when I was at the Creative Arts Council, we started engaging almost all the facets of the art. And so we've aggregated them at the moment. We started um, putting the data together because one of the challenges was also data. You don't even know where to find them unless they choose to approach. And so now the data collection is ongoing. And so very soon with the data that we'll have, it will be difficult to give excuses that you didn't know that there was a group like this or they had people like this. And so I would support my forthcoming boss, Minister um, Honorable Dr. Awal, to recognize and share the cake equally. Thank you, Honorable. Um, my next question has to do with the Bureau of Languages. I'm one of the advocates of the fact that language plays a critical role in the promotion of arts and culture. Uh, <laughs> do you see it as part of the Ministry of Culture? <laughs> and if you do, do you know the situation of the Bureau of Languages now? And what will you do to make sure we don't kill that important baby? Thank you, Honorable Chair. Bureau of Languages is, is still relevant in the ministry. In my first four years in the Creative Art Council, I engaged them and then we started some marketing. And so they have a program on Adom FM, which is used to sell the Ghanaian language. It is not enough. We need to do more. We need to market our language more. People at the moment even look down on ourselves when we have to speak our local languages. We, we think it is, um, it is of a lower class to speak your own language. And so we want to sell our languages as sexy. Sorry, in quotes. And where I come from, if, if we say sexy, it means appealing. So that the young, the youth will see something beautiful in the Ghanaian name and the Ghanaian um, languages. Like Samini had to change from Batman to Samini. There's some beauty in changing from Batman to Samini. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Shatawale from Bandana to Shatawale. Thank you. Chairman, Chairman pass away my last. <laughs> <laughs> um, during my days, arts and culture was compulsory on our timetable in school. Compulsory. So it builds and inculcated into us the love for our arts and culture. And even at Legon, when first year, I wasn't a drama, but I was going to drama all the time. Today, it's become almost part of a subject. Would you support the advocacy that we arts and culture on its own as a subject so that our children will become imbibed in our own arts and culture so that we reduce the influence of these foreign cultures. The one I don't want to see cry are the young ones who dress up and, show, and put their trousers down and have their panties showing. Yes. It's, it's in, my, in our days, you dare not dress that way in front of any elder. Please. Oh, that was not my days, please. It's uh, Susu's days. <laughs> it's the JHS SSS days. <laughs> not the O level days. No. It's a serious thing for me. Do you think we have to make arts and culture an examinable subject, a compulsory subject, on an educational curriculum so that? As you grow, you, 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 it doesn't matter where you are. You learn one aspect of our culture and tradition as possible. 
Thank you, Honorable Chair. Your, your suggestion or question um, will touch on the broadcast law as well as our commitment to, to change the narratives. The, it took just one man to change the way the young people dress. And that is why I heard somebody undertone, someone said Otto Fista. And it was because for that particular season, we watched football and Otto Fista was the only one we saw. And so by the time we were through with that particular tournament, our youth started dressing like that. That's the power of television. And so we must have interest as statesmen how and what we show on our television. Because even if one man or two fist that can change the whole country, then if we begin to get 10 or 20 of two fist that, can we that, imagine? That talking about that, that it's very interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm not very much of a television person. I, I hardly watch apart from news. But any time I go home from work, what I see is something that is, is, is not familiar to me. It's not Ghanaian. Even though they are purporting to come to go show it in Ghanaian languages. Kumkumbajia, or that. that. Uh, there are the new ones. I find it very offensive. So I go straight to stay in my bedroom. I, 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 don't, I don't want to have anything to do with those things. But you have your media commission, you have your ministry, you have, and it is growing. It's not limited to just one station. It appears to be the order of the day. That juxtaposed to your statement that the power of television, what we show. What happened to the series that you were showing um, but, uh, by the fireside? On top of that, even uh, Ghana Wood, uh, that was the name we call them, Gali Wood, Kuma Wood, what happened to them? Why have we lost those contents on our television? Thank, thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, I remember a few months ago, or weeks, when Dr. Awal, Honorable, came here, he mentioned that he was going to set up a studio that was going to take care of our film and the music industry. We must be ready to compete as a country as well. Because even if they do not, the youth or the people in Ghana do not consume via television, they will consume via phone because of social media or online activities. And so we must be ready to also shoot films that are exportable, that we can also consume some based on our culture on our television. At the moment, we are not able to compete some way, somehow, because of standards. And that is why I support Honorable Dr. Awal in the studio that he wants to build, so that technology that can match up today's competition we can get all of that plus technical know-how to compete. Thank you, Honorable Chair. You mean on our... Marco Krikumante there, he's been voted for the uh, Deputy Ministerial position at the Tourism and Creative Arts Ministry. We'll bring you the highlights subsequently. Right now, let's go for a break. We'll be right back. And this is where my time ends. We're doing Let's Talk Showbiz as a way of wrapping up the show. Do stay and enjoy it. There's more news at myjoyonline.com. You know that for sure. Gunmen kill wife of GNPC boss's driver in Kumase. That's one of the big stories that you can read. And the story about the IGP commiserating with the family of the police officer killed by the armed robbers there as well. My name is Gifty Andopia. I'd love to see you again tomorrow, God willing.